Uh, good morning, everybody. If I could call your attention to come in and take, uh, take your seats so that we could get the next panel started on time. And uh, let's start with the one NOAA video, please, as folks come in. And I'd like to encourage folks to come up to the front. Uh, we, uh, we had reserved seats in the last session, uh, which are now open to everybody. So I'd like to encourage folks to come on in and, uh, and take your seats up front as well. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, before I introduce the next panel, I'd like to make a few prefatory remarks. Uh, first of all, to go back to uh, the closing question of the previous panel, I want to make sure everybody knows that there was a major scoop in, uh, that was announced by Barton Seaver, Chow on Chow, uh, talking about the, uh, the menu for next week's uh, um, dinner sponsored by Secretary Kerry for the dignitaries that are coming in from around the world. Uh, Acadian redfish as the main course that will be served, a uh, very noble bottom fish uh, of, the, um, of the northeast Gulf of Maine. So chow on chow. Uh, Mike also mentioned at the beginning of that panel uh, some of our sponsors. In fact, he called out Mystic Seaport. Uh, and, um, and we were indeed delighted to have Mystic Seaport as a sponsor this year, given what they're doing uh, with the Charles W. Morgan. Uh, just down the road from the seaport, we have Mystic Aquarium. Mystic Aquarium, through its parent Sea Research Foundation, is also a sponsor of Capitol Hill Ocean Week, uh, and they've been doing so for many years. Uh, sea Research Foundation, in addition to overseeing Mystic Aquarium, also oversees the Jason Project. Um, and I want to spend a moment talking about our partnership with uh, Aquaria around the country, uh, because it's not just Mystic Aquarium, but it's others, uh, like Monterey Bay Aquarium and the National Aquarium. For the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, prioritizing these partnerships with Aquaria is really critical. We've talked a lot over the last couple of days about the importance of sanctuaries, expanding sanctuaries in our offshore waters and in our Great Lakes. But I think, as you guys know, sanctuaries are not all that accessible. First of all, they're underwater, so you've got to be a diver uh, to really enjoy them firsthand. But they're also not all that close to shore in many cases, and sometimes they're even in pretty remote islands. So they don't quite have the infrastructure that their terrestrial brethren have, uh, the national parks. They don't have easy access through airports or big cities. They don't have historic concessions to lure people like Yosemite and the Grand Canyon have. They don't have ring roads like Yellowstone and other national parks have. So the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, in order to do its job promoting national marine sanctuaries, we need to rely on partners like our Aquaria around the country because they serve as portals to national marine sanctuaries. We can't easily get the public into our national marine sanctuaries, so we have to have our national marine sanctuaries brought to the public. And it's the aquaria around the country that do that. I'll mention also that we have AZA, um, which oversees the zoo, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquaria, also as a sponsor of Chow. And uh, these are, again, really important partnerships for us. We've embarked on a new lecture series with the National Aquarium. Uh, that you can find online that's taking place up in Baltimore. Uh, as I mentioned, we work closely with Mont Monterey Bay Aquarium on the West Coast. And in our partnership with Mystic Aquarium, I'm delighted to say that we have a first ever for Capitol Hill Ocean Week. Uh, with all of our emphasis moving to the new space here at the museum, it really is to be able to take advantage of the IT and the web access and make sure that uh, folks online have the opportunity 
to hear and see and learn what we want to present to you as our audience in person. And so it's really a great delight to welcome our first ever online audience uh, through a pin site up at Mystic, at Mystic Aquarium. Mystic Aquarium does an awful lot of research uh, on ocean uh, and human health. They have a strong veterinary program as well. And so they have an audience there that will be watching uh, with questions that will be coming in specifically from uh, the aquarium. And in fact, after this session breaks, they will be having their own internal discussion to pick up some of the themes that are discussed here. And so uh, it's really a very important way for us to expand the reach beyond these four walls, beyond the Beltway, and into uh, communities across the country. So, um, so we're very excited to welcome Mystic Aquarium with us this morning. So with that, let me turn to, uh, to the next panel. We heard an awful lot uh, in the last hour and a half about human health and fisheries and the fact that we need to eat more fish in order to be healthier ourselves. And this panel is going to expand the discussion in terms of the relation between ocean, ocean resources, and human health, looking at what the latest science and the latest connections are to environment, health, public-private partnerships, seed-derived pharmaceutical products, all to enhance our own human health. To lead the discussion is Dr. J. D. J. Grimes, otherwise known as J. Grimes. Dr. Grimes is a professor and a former director of the Gulf Coast Research Laboratory at the University of Mississippi. Previously, he was vice chair uh, on the Consortium of Oceanographic Research and Education, known as CORE, otherwise today known as Ocean Leadership. He's been on a number of panels uh, that he's chaired, and he's science advisor to the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative. And as many of you know, we were, um, we were honored to recognize the co-chairs of JOSI, uh, Norman Ed and Bill Ruckelshaus, early in the week with our Lifetime Achievement Award. So it's a nice connection among all of the personalities and among the issues. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jay. Thank you. Well, we... First of all, I would like to thank the uh, National Marine Sanctuary Foundation for sponsoring this, this session. And for those of you that don't know much about oceans and human health, hopefully you will in an hour from now. Uh, oceans and human health covers a broad variety of things, and, and our three speakers today will address those. But uh, as was just pointed out, it includes disease, it includes toxins, both uh, heavy metals as well as biological toxins uh, produced by harmful algae, uh, natural products, which we'll hear a lot about today, seafood, uh, oxygen, and finally tourism. And that's a huge component uh, of oceans and human health is the, the tourism component. The uh, <clears throat> speakers today will start out with Dr. Don Rice from the National Science Foundation. Uh, Don has been in oceans and human health, as the kids say from the get-go. So uh, Don will have valuable insight as to what's going on with regard to oceans and human health in the United States. Uh, Dr. Samantha, or Sam Simmons, is the Assistant Scientific Program Director for the U.S. Marine Mammal Commission. And she has some very interesting things to talk about with regard to marine mammals. And I jokingly told her, Three years ago, I, the only thing I knew about marine mammals was the fact that they're mammals. And now all three of my PhD students are working on bottlenose dolphins, so you know, <laughs> figure that one out. And then finally, we have Dr. Frank Fang. Uh, Frank is going to talk about the exciting and as of yet still uh, broadly untapped uh, resource that we have in the ocean with regard to natural products, both pharmaceuticals as well as uh, useful industrial chemicals. And I think we've done much more with pharmaceuticals than we have with industrial chemicals. And you can probably comment on that in your talk. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the first speaker, uh, Don. Thank you, Jay. Uh, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, join you today and talk a little bit about um, how I see oceans and human health and how oceans and human health has developed as a research opportunity through sponsorship of the National Science Foundation. Um, let me say, uh, I think that the, you could say that the modern uh, structure of what we call oceans and human health as a research entity in the United States uh, began in uh, 1999 when uh, the National Research Council convened 
a, uh, a special panel to discuss uh, specific phenomena related to the ocean and its interaction with humans that in fact human that in fact impact human well-being not only in terms of uh, uh, things that help us lead happy and healthy and long lives but also things that uh, on occasion uh, create adversity for us uh, they produced uh, as a result of that meeting a uh, uh, publication call from monsoons to microbes in other words from the big things all the way down to the little things in the oceans that uh, impact our lives uh, every single day even if we don't live on the ocean even if we live far from it in fact um, my own personal um, involvement with that goes back uh, some at least 10 years earlier when I was a professor at the University of Maryland and um, I became aware that when uh, the weather got hot and um, after the uh, uh, snow had melted up Susquehanna River, uh, the Chesapeake Bay would stratify. That is, it would get uh, very fresh on the top and it would still be cold, at the cold and salty at the bottom. And then it would become anoxic. And the anoxia would spread from the center of the bay up the tributaries uh, into the salt marshes and the around surrounding communities where it could intersect sewage systems. And looking at that as a biogeochemist, I thought, you know, this, something like this really just extends the conditions uh, in the human gut that, make, that can make it hospitable for things that really we don't want to get in our seafood or oysters and crabs and fish and so forth or in our drinking water or in the water that we swim in and distribute it all around. We should think more about this. And um, I soon discovered that there were already people who were thinking about it. Very notably, right in my own backyard, Rita Caldwell, who was just up at the other end of uh, Chesapeake Bay in Baltimore. Uh, in the interim, um, as a result of that, uh, NSF and NIEHS uh, got together and we decided that what we really needed to do to uh, advance uh, uh, understanding uh, not only of the oceanography, the oceanographic phenomena that impact uh, our well-being as humans, um, but also how that oceanography intersects biomedicine, microbiology, uh, and uh, human physiology and psychology for all, uh, for that matter. Um, it took us about, uh, about three and a half years to uh, produce something from that, and we ended up uh, establishing the first four centers uh, for oceans and human health uh, in the United States. The idea was that, uh, that we had, the fundamental idea was that we would bring two communities, two scientific communities that had never worked together before into proximity with each other and then let them produce. The oceanographic community and the uh, uh, public health uh, human uh, uh, pathogens community come together. Um, it's been very successful. And I would say today that um, when we hear the words OSINGE and human health, there's a tendency to think primarily about bad things that happen in the ocean. We hear about harmful algal blooms, red tides, uh, uh, pathogens, uh, intrapathogens from humans that make it out into seawater and get into our seafood and so forth. But uh, speaking as an oceanographer, the thing I first want to say is that overwhelmingly, the ocean does far more good for our health than, um, than the little bit of bad that happens. The little bit of bad can be very costly. The great amount of good is absolutely necessary. Um, for example, um, most of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean, from the phytoplankton that, uh, that uh, fix carbon, make, uh, take in up uh, CO2, make organic carbon, and release oxygen. Most of that comes from the ocean. The ocean takes up part of it to keep itself going, and what's left over is for everybody else. The second thing is that uh, we live on a, a thermostated, habitable planet. Uh, and it's due to the fact that we have water over the surface. 
The sun shines on the equator, makes it very hot, but because of the rotation of the Earth, that heat gets distributed poleward, and it moves around. It makes life not only more habitable on the equator, but it makes it habitable other places. It provides fresh water through evaporation to the rest of the Earth. Um, uh, and uh, as has been a very big item in the news for the past uh, 20, 25 years, unless you've been asleep, uh, the ocean is a major sink for the carbon dioxide that uh, goes into the atmosphere as a result of processing fossil fuels. Um, so it is a regulator of the atmospheric um, heat content through uh, both regulating water and for carbon dioxide. Um, now, uh, Jay has uh, already mentioned something about uh, uh, the microbiology, uh, and I've hinted at it as um, uh, issues regarding um, uh, enteric disease, seafood poisoning, uh, 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 that sort of thing. But um, uh, in the last uh, uh, five years or so, uh, after we've been focusing on um, harmful algal blooms and uh, intrapathogens in the ocean, we're starting to turn more attention toward uh, contaminants in the ocean. Uh, cosmetics that we use on a daily basis, hormones that we use, the, the hormones in birth control pills, for example, um, mercury and lead, which have, are eternal poisons that are always there. We're putting them back in the ocean. Uh, uh, some of these things are oil soluble. They go up, they move up the food chain and they come right back to us. Um, a huge amount of effort now in uh, the NIEHS and NSF effort has been in supporting centers and individual researchers to address this in a new way like we've never done before. Um, there are other uh, ocean hazards, but uh, I think for right now, what um, we should really do is go on to talk about some of the more exciting things uh, in marine mammals research and how that relates to humans and uh, to some other things, which Jay would talk about. Thank you. Sam? All right. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this morning, I'm talking about a very important, but as Jay indicated, a very broad topic. And so I'd like to try and focus my comments this morning on marine mammals as a nexus for understanding ocean changes, ocean health, and implications for human health by giving you a few examples. But first, why marine mammals? Well, they are charismatic. They do capture the imagination of the public. And so they provide a great hook for communication and education on broader ocean health issues. Um, but there are plenty of other marine organisms that might tell us something about ocean or human health. So I think most importantly when considering questions of health, the fact that they are mammals, like us, is key. They have similar basic biology and physiology and are susceptible to many of the same diseases and types of health threats as we are. Also like humans, marine mammals are apex predators of the marine food web. In many cases, they eat the same species of fish as humans. And so many of the uh, contaminants or toxins that might bioaccumulate in the food chain and affect us likely will also affect marine mammals. And by studying the effects of the contaminants or toxins on marine mammals, we can get an idea of the potential effects on human health. So the first illustration of this nexus I'd like to describe involves um, seals and mercury levels. There's um, a fair amount of concern about mercury levels in seafood, and rightly so. Mercury is neurotoxic. It can impact brain function and it's been shown to cause kidney damage as well. So it's important to understand mercury accumulation in the marine food web, um, and as apex marine predators, again, marine mammals can provide good indicators of where there might be problems. Some very recent work, hot off the presses from the University of California in Santa Cruz, has shown um, relatively high average levels of mercury in northern elephant seals. And this is unusual because adult female northern elephant seals spend up to 10 months of the year foraging out in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean at depth. They dive to between 400 and 600 meters regularly to obtain their food. So this is well away um, from any of the more commonly acknowledged point sources of mercury. And these resu results have fueled questions about where the mercury in the elephant seals is coming from. 
And if it's in the food chain at depth, way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, maybe we have a larger or a different problem than we've realized to this point with mercury. Um, the second example I'd like to give is a story that many of you may be familiar with by now, um, but it only came to light as a problem about 16 years ago when hundreds of California sea lions were stranded along the coast of California. The animals that were stranding were adult females in relatively good condition, so they were nice and fat, they'd eaten recently, but they were being found having seizures on the beaches, and the cause of the seizures was unknown. Um, it's through, it was through some multidisciplinary work and partnerships, um, as Don was touching on, um, only through that that the full story came to light, um, involving researchers that were working on the phytoplankton, working on fish, and also those responding to the stranding sea lions. As many of you know, it turns out the sea lions were suffering from domoic acid toxicosis or domoic acid, acid poisoning. So they were being affected by a toxin, the domoic acid, produced by diatoms in the family Pseudonychia and Nychia. The diatoms were being eaten by fil fi filter-feeding fish, sardines and anchovies. The sea lions were eating the anchovies and were getting a massive dose of the domoic acid that was causing seizures, disorientation, and other neurologic effects. But why all of a sudden was there this massive problem? Those diatoms occur in large numbers in many areas of the ocean, and the catastrophic effects being seen in sea lions hadn't been seen before. Further studies revealed that there's a, actually a connection between the levels of urea, a soluble form of nitrogen, in the water and the levels of domoic acid production by the diatoms. So the more urea that's available to them in the water, the more they bloom, but at some point they also switch over to producing this toxin. And there's a connection back to the terrestrial environment here as one source of urea into the marine system is runoff from terrestrial environment. Um, a lot of agricultural fertilizers have a lot of urea or nitrogen in them. So this is a case where investigations into an acute marine mammal health problem has led us to a greater understanding of how the marine ecosystem functions and when that system can be pushed out of balance with toxic consequences. Domoic acid can also affect humans. It causes amnesic shellfish poisoning that can re result in permanent short-term memory loss, brain damage, and in severe cases, even death. Most people are exposed to domoic acid by, through eating mussels or other shellfish, bottom-dwelling filter feeders. Now, there's a time lag between when sea lions and humans might be exposed to the toxins from the same diatom bloom, because the sea lions are eating the filter-feeding fish offshore in the ocean, but the diatoms and toxin have to be carried inshore, settle and accumulate in the mussels before human exposure is likely. Now that we know how that system works, in California, sea lions are acting as one part of a warning system for human seafood safety. Finally, I'd like to briefly mention antibiotic-resistant bacteria, which is a, a huge problem in the human health world. Um, but it's not just the human health world where it's a concern. Antibiotic-resistant bacteria are found in skin wounds and the lungs of marine mammals, including the notorious MRSA. So this is just another example of a nexus between marine mammal and human health, and an illustration of how widespread the issue of antibiotic resistance really is. Um, so I think I'll wrap it up there, but I hope I've provided some illustration of how marine mammals can act as a nexus for understanding ocean changes ocean health and implications for human health. I'd like to suggest that we should be incorporating measures of the health of marine mammals and other marine organisms into ocean monitoring and observing systems. It's a key part of understanding the ecosystem. The Marine Mammal Commission is part of a multi-partner effort that's currently working to make marine mammal health data available through the US IUS, the Integrated Ocean Observing System. Other partners in this effort include the Marine Mammal Health and Stranding Response Program of NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service, partner members of the Stranding Network, and the West Coast Regional Associations under IUS, NANU, SENCUS, and SCUS. We hope ultimately this will be a national program and so we'll have all the other um, regional associations involved as well. We're also working with collaborators from USAID's PREDICT program and the US Geological Survey's National Wildlife Health Center that are helping us make connections to health monitoring and terrestrial wildlife. One ocean, one health. Um, I hope the value of this effort would be recognized and support would be given to similar programs that are examining the health of marine organisms, especially when addressing questions of ocean health. 
rather surprisingly, the Ocean Health Index that was first published in Nature in 2012, as it currently stands, does not include any goals or metrics related to what most people associate with the term health, i.e., are you sick or not? It would seem appropriate to include some measures of health in an Ocean Health Index. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sam. Uh, our next speaker is going to talk about what I call the good. I, I team taught a course one time in oceans and human health, and we had a harmful algal bloom expert, and I was the uh, waterborne disease guy, and then we had a natural products. So we nicknamed our course the good, the bad, and the ugly. So you've heard about the bad and the ugly. Now we're going to hear about the good from Frank. Thanks, Jay, and good morning. So I would like to say that the connection between basic research around the structure and function and uh, properties of marine toxins and public health are very direct um, and clear. However, it takes a long time to develop a drug, and so sometimes it's not always apparent over the decades of research that go into it that that connection is, in fact, very real. Um, nature is unequaled in her ability to generate and create biologically active molecular structures. More than half of the drugs that are approved and over 70% of the oncology drugs are natural product based. On the other hand, as we've heard, oceans, despite covering 70% of our planet, still represent a relatively underdeveloped resource um, for new medicines. In 1986, a new marine natural product with promising and potent in vivo and in vitro properties as an anti-cancer agent was reported by professors Waymura and Harada at Nagoya University in Japan. That compound was helichondrin B. However, uh, only 12 milligrams of material was isolated from over 600 kilograms of the marine sponge. So immediately, the material supply prevented further evaluation of the full uh, medicinal potential of that compound. Concurrently, Professor Yoshido Kishi at Harvard University was investigating the synthesis of a very complex sponge called, um, derived material called palytoxin, which is the causative agent of shellfish poisoning. And he had devised new methods for making these complex materials a reaction that came to be known as the nozaki hiyamakishi reaction. Basic research in the marine function, uh, the synthesis of that toxin provided the tools to enable his group to make helichondrin B. I was fortunate to be able to participate in that program while a NIH postdoctoral fellow in his labs from 1989 to 1991. And there, firsthand, I I gained an appreciation for the power of that reaction to construct complex materials. The synthesis of helicon B was reported in 1992, and it provided the materials for further biological evaluation, as well as the tools to manipulate the structure in a way that led Azai to become interested in developing that as a potential anti-cancer agent. In 1998, a clinical candidate was identified at Azai, and a cooperative research and development agreement was signed with the National Cancer Institute. At this time, the long-term issue of material supply needed to be addressed on a different scale in order to proceed from the laboratory to full clinical evaluation. Given the large number of steps, uh, 62, that were required for the overall synthesis, practical issues around material throughput and quality control also needed to be dealt with. Two key challenges were identified. Development of the NHK reaction from laboratory scale to the pilot plant, and two, development of crystallization-based purification strategies for each fragment, as well as the overall assembly. Over 90% of the manufacturing time and cost for any chemical step can often be the purification. Crystallization has the advantage of dramatically shortening that processing time, improving quality control, and significantly reducing the solvent waste stream from production, and thereby the, uh, minimizing the carbon imprint. Designing syntheses of each of the halogen building blocks on structurally defined carbohydrate templates had the advantage of increasing the likelihood of discovering crystalline intermediates, 
as well as utilizing renewable feedstocks and thereby preserving the ocean environment. While I've mentioned the power of the NHK reaction in connecting complex multifunctional building blocks, the reaction had thus far only been demonstrated and utilized in a laboratory setting, never in production. The development of the process from the laboratory to our pilot plant in Andover, Massachusetts, required the understanding and control of numerous reaction parameters in order to successfully manufacture this drug substance. Clinical trials ensued, and in 2010, the FDA approved Halivin for the treatment of late-stage breast cancer. Halivin was the first single-agent therapy to demonstrate improved overall survival in women with advanced breast cancer. The direct link between ocean and human health, as I said, is, is not always appreciated because of the length of time it takes to develop a new medicine, yet this example provides a, a clear example of, of that link. AZI continues to be actively involved in initiating and progressing new medicines inspired by nature. One of the keys to our ability to find these new drug leads is the biodiversity in nature. And we hope that this successful collaboration between the government, academia, and industry can serve as a model for future successful partnerships. OK, I'd like to open this session up for questions. And I have the first question from the audience. And it says, what is the greatest source of mercury to the oceans? The uh, largest source of mercury to the ocean uh, has actually changed within our lifetime. Um, originally, uh, the, the greatest source was uh, uh, volcanoes, both underwater volcanoes and uh, 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 terrestrial volcanoes. Uh, after that, uh, just simple weathering of rock. Uh, we have just within um, the last uh, 20, 25 years or so, moved into a situation where uh, humans have, uh, have uh, found all sorts of uses for mercury uh, and have uh, stored it because we then uh, discovered that it could be very toxic and that it was everywhere. Uh, and if you actually wanted to uh, uh, make a, a new chemical in your industry and you want it to be absolutely mercury free, you have to take absolutely uh, extraordinary steps to keep the ambient mercury out of it. So we have a really, really special environment. So it's everywhere now uh, because we have assisted uh, 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 the rest of geological nature and getting mercury out of rocks uh, to use. Now we're uh, tasked with uh, keeping it contained. Can you address the, uh, the different health effects of elemental mercury versus methyl mercury and, and uh, well, there, there are several, several forms of mercury that are in the environment. Um, uh, those of us at a certain age um, can remember actually being allowed to handle metallic mercury pour from hand to hand. It's uh, over 13 times heavier than water, and it's very impressive to a, to a small budding chemist. Um, uh, uh, but uh, the primary risk of, of metallic mercury right now. There may be toxicologists in the room uh, who may know more about this than I do, but the primary risk of metallic mercury right now is getting it into an environment where it can be converted into something else that is more bioreactive. Um, that there's inor inorganic mercury that is not metallic, but things like mercury chloride or mercury nitrate or you know, any, anything like that. Very soluble in water, um, particularly in fresh water. Um, but uh, uh, it moves around everywhere. And again, its primary um, uh, health hazard is that it can get into an environment where it's converted into the thing that is really bad. And that brings us to the really bad things. The really bad um, uh, mercury uh, uh, compounds are the organic compounds, particularly the ones that are um, uh, oil soluble. That is, they can accumulate in fat. Um, um, methyl mercury, dimethyl mercury, um, are created uh, in nature, um, in both fresh water, seawater, and in soil, when a certain type of bacteria uh, 
uh, are exposed to just either metallic mercury or inorganic mercury, and they can make these uh, 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 methylmercury and, and dimethylmercury compounds. Um, those go up the food chain very fast, very fast, and um, uh, uh, in particular, uh, at the very high trophic levels, um, uh, top predators um, in terrestrial environments, and especially in the ocean to which mercury eventually washes down to, top ocean predators. Uh, tuna is notorious, of course. Um, there are special problems that have to be dealt with in keeping mercury contamination out of mariculture centers, for example. Um, but generally, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the metallic form. And, and um, the others, the primary issue with those is that eventually they can get into situations where bacteria can convert them to the organic forms. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take these questions in order. So the next question is, are some of the health issues that are affecting marine mammals due to climate change? If so, will humans suffer from the same health problems? So are marine mammals warning us? I think in, in many ways, in some cases, for some of those things, you could say, yes, they are. Um, specific examples of that climate change is um, resulting in changes in distributions of the animals. And so exposures to, di to different diseases is changing as animals are moving around to find food in different areas. Um, so you have an increase in the transmission rate and, and where um, a lot of the diseases are being found. Um, some of those diseases are transmissible to humans, so it's possible the, the risk to humans is being magnified there. Um, but in general, um, I think in that case, it's, it's limited mostly to, to marine mammals. They are certainly good in indicators of other aspects of climate change um, and potential impacts to, to humans and human health. Okay, thank you. The next question is, how involved are communities in protecting their oceans and coasts? Because mercury poses a high risk to the average citizen, do you feel a push from average citizens for knowledge on their local water sources and protection from uh, overexposure? And we don't have a socioeconomic expert sitting up here, but we can all tackle it, can't we? We can, we can, we can tackle try it piecemeal. Right. I, I think. Um, well, there's no greater uh, force to get um, regulation and research done than um, the individual voter who will actually vote. <laughs> um, so uh, I think from, from what I've seen from uh, NSF perspective and getting uh, uh, research initiatives started to, vote, to address community environmental concerns, um, uh, it appears to me from what I see on Capitol Hill, that uh, congressmen are quite responsive. And we certainly hear about it. And uh, we're encouraged to uh, invest uh, our research funds there. Um, I think probably uh, someone from uh, NOAA or EPA, if uh, they're available for comment, might be able to uh, give us a, a better idea of how effective community action is and, and getting things done. Anyone else want to tackle that? Okay. What is the role of gender in human ocean health? How can empowering women enable greater ocean health? Uh, you are the women. <laughs> I am the women. I speak on behalf of all women. Um, I th I, can, you, can you repeat the question, Jay, just so I make sure? <laughs> okay, listen carefully. What is the role of gender in human slash ocean health? How can empowering women enable greater ocean health? I, that's a big question for a start. Um, I think that's... I'll, answer it the way I think you should for any situation in that I'm not sure there is a role for gender or there shouldn't be a role for gender. Um, tackling the problems um, should be dealt with by um, smart, articulate, like me at the moment, people. <laughs> and that, that's not necessarily sex-based. Those characteristics and those qualities aren't sex-based. I think um, it certainly helps to have um, 
more women uh, tackling some of these issues we heard in the first panel this morning. Um, mercury in seafood is particularly problematic and of concern to pregnant women and young children. And so uh, from that perspective, as a, a stereotypical homemaker, um, I think empowering women uh, to understand more about the issues, understand more about the connections between ocean health and their health and human health um, will help raise the issues um, and perhaps get at some of those questions of how the communities can turn around and, and help tackle the problems. Can I quick, just quickly add that I thought that was an excellent answer. I mean, your, I mean your, your first two sentences were just perfect because uh, uh, these are, th this, these should not be gender issues. I mean, they, they, they should not be. But at the same time, uh, when it comes to, uh, to uh, uh, attending to health issues, uh, whether it's uh, for oneself or uh, one's spouse or one's family or friends or particularly for one's children, women seem to always uh, bear the far greater burden in making things happen. So it shouldn't be that way, but there's something about the way we are as a species that makes it end up being that way. From a disease perspective, uh, Jim Oliver and his uh, students, postdocs, made the discovery that estrogen has a sparing effect with regard to Vibrio vulnificus infections. Uh, men tend to get these more than women, and again, it's because of the estrogen sparing effect. So. Next question. It seems that oceans and human health nexus is a no-brainer. Why is there an appearance from ocean science community that it is that it does not have a higher priority? And I have an add-on to that too, and you know what that's going to be. That is really good. Um, what, back in um, 2001, when we st first started working at, with NIHS on developing oceans and human health uh, initiative. Um, uh, a tremendous number of oceanography colleagues from the community, from the academic community, and uh, within NSF it, itself who said, and I'll paraphrase, this is not what I signed up for. I like, I like the, uh, the sea breeze and the spray and, and, and the, the waves and, um, and that seeing the whale spouting and all this kind of thing. Some people just don't want it to be that way um, without getting um, operatic about this. I mean, when, when Al Gore said that some things are inconvenient truths, I mean, this, it is an inconvenient truth that, that the ocean isn't Jonathan Livingston's seagull. And by the way, seagulls are, are uh, scavengers. Um, <laughs> but there, there are things that, that some oceanographers would re rather not deal with. That's changed a lot now because, you know, if we don't deal with it, uh, there's nobody left. Like Chaucer's priest said in the Canterbury Tales, the gold at the rest, then what will the iron do? Okay. I was going to ask a question. I'll just add an observation and we'll go to the next question. That observation is that with regard to Congress and the executive office in the United States, oceans and human health is somewhat static. It's not being given much credence. Whereas in Europe, it, it's ramping up. I wouldn't say rapidly, but uh, the European community has really gotten interested in oceans and human health, and uh, they're doing a lot with it. So once again, invented here, but copied elsewhere. <clears throat> OK, next question. What species of marine mammal is most commonly affected by antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and how widespread is this problem? So it's a good question. I'm not sure that I could answer what species is most commonly affected. I just know that we're starting to see it in, in skin infections, wounds, and in the lungs of uh, many different species of marine mammals now, in, including the MRSA, the methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus that I mentioned in, in my talk. I think it's something that's worth investigating further, and in, um, some surveys um, through the Stranding Network might be a good way to do that. The Marine Mammal Stranding Network might be a good way to get a handle on that and look at whether or not the occurrence is greater in populated areas in the, in the oceans around populated areas, so whether there's a direct connection with the human population, the antibiotic resistance there, or whether it's really more widespread than that. And, and I can add to that. Uh, Years ago, it was safe to say that the marine vibrios, which include cholera and perihemolyticus and the flesh-eating 
organism Vulnificus, uh, they were pretty much sensitive to most antibiotics. That's not the case today. Uh, most of these marine vibrios that cause human disease and fish disease, I might add, uh, are antibiotic resistant. The, uh, another interesting thing that's just recently popped up with regard to marine mammals is one of my students is doing viromics uh, in conjunction with the J. Craig Venner Institute in Rockville. And they've discovered HIV and several other human viruses that shouldn't be in bottlenose dolphins, but they're there. So I find that intriguing, and we're trying to get that one figured out. With uh, pathological impacts? Presumably, but we don't know that. I mean, we've just made that discovery, and I told my students, send that back to the JCVI and have them fully sequenced, and they did, and it's HIV and some other human uh, RNA viruses that shouldn't be there, but they're there. What is your opinion slash thoughts on aquaculture? Fish farms impact on human health, the potential negative impacts. And since my lab does mostly marine aquaculture, not microbiology, I'll comment on that too, but any of you want to run with that first? So. It's mine, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that wild catch fishery cannot keep up with the demand, particularly in Japan and the United States. There's just no way, and every, everyone admits that. And we see as, as the savior, uh, marine aquaculture. And so, for example, at my lab, we're working on red snapper, uh, we're working on striped bass, uh, we're working on a couple of other things, and we're even thinking about yellowfin tuna, but that's down the road a bit. Uh, there's great potential there. However, uh, with regard to the red snapper, we find that oftentimes as the snapper reach the fingerling size, the entire tank crashes uh, with disease caused by vol Vibrio vulnificus. So it's not only catastrophic to the poor marine aquaculture person that's trying to raise those red snapper, there's no way FDA is going to let you market that stuff if it has Vibrio vulnificus in it. So that's, a, that's one of the problems involved with uh, marine aquaculture. But having said that, I still think there are ways that we can circumvent that and that eventually marine aquaculture will become very, very important. Uh, it's already important worldwide. Uh, it's said that eight out of every 10 shrimp on your plate uh, come from a foreign country, and of those eight, about 75% are produced by marine aquaculture worldwide. We're not doing much with that in the US for a whole bunch of reasons, including uh, environmental restrictions and the price of land and all of that, but uh, worldwide, uh, shrimp production is, is very high. Jay, Jay. you mentioned uh, uh, Vibrio vulnificus a couple of times now, mm -hmm. and uh, I recall back during uh, when a lot of us here were involved uh, with uh, the aftermath of Katrina mm -hmm. down in New Orleans, mm -hmm. that uh, the Vibrios figured very uh, heavily in human, uh, in, in human health impact down there. And um, at the time, there was a contrast between the relative severity of disease in humans uh, from, from consuming uh, either by, by, by water or by, by seafood, uh, Vibrio vulnificus, or having it uh, contracted right. parenterally. Right. Uh, is, uh, does that impact your concerns at all about, um, about Vibrios and, and mariculture? It does. Uh, you know, you can contract these things, as, as Don just said, orally or through a wound infection, and you, know, you don't want to do either one of those, but it, very definitely uh, the oral contraction is a problem. Uh, <clears throat> With regard to Katrina, and I've forgotten the statistics, I haven't read them for two or three years, but there were five deaths, as I recall. And I think there were something like two from Vibrio perihemolyticus. And we're, having, we're starting to see more and more problems with perihemolyticus uh, throughout the world and in the United States. There may have been one death from Volnificus. And then an elderly couple uh, didn't properly prepare shrimp, the old thing of, of uh, taking your cooked turkey and putting it back on the cutting board. Well, they took their their cooked shrimp and put it back on a board that it had raw shrimp on it. So they reinfected the shrimp uh, with cholera. And, and both the man and the woman came down with, with cholera, uh, clinical cholera, but neither one of them died. They were able to, re to reverse it. The last question that I see here, has the runoff from Fukushima started showing up in marine life, and what are the implications for human health? It has, it has shown up 
in um, water and debris uh, in um, some sediment and atmospheric um, aerosol on the uh, west coast of the United States. Um, I can tell you, uh, I, I don't know about uh, marine uh, animals at this point. Uh, the primary thing that, that we're concerned about is cesium-137, strontium-90, which are fission products uh, from, uh, uh, from nuclear reactors. And so we know it came from there. But I can tell you from everything I've seen in, um, in the water analyses, the air analyses, the aerosol analyses from the North Pacific Ocean and uh, west coast of the United States, that uh, they are not at levels uh, that warrant uh, uh, public health measures being taken. I can recall two years ago when I chaired the Gordon Conference on Oceans and Human Health, and I think you were there, we had an expert from University of Washington speak on Fukushima, and he said the levels they were seeing at that point in time, and it hadn't reached the U.S. two years ago, but the levels they were seeing were far less than background. So, yeah, okay. These questions are from Mystic, and I'm sorry we have five minutes left, but we'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, the first question from Mystic. If we could stop sources of mercury today, is there an idea uh, that the existing mercury being passed through filter feeders? I didn't say that right. Is there an idea of the existing mercury? Uh, okay, an idea of how much existing mercury is being passed through filter feeders, I think is what that question is saying. Okay. I, I, to the best of my knowledge, there's, there's not a good way of, of quantifying the whole picture. Um, there, Don was talking about um, the different types of mercury and the different um, sources, and I, I think um, artisanal gold mining around the world and gold mining, historic gold mining in the U.S. are additional sources of mercury, um, as well as the burning of, of fossil fuels in organic mercury is a byproduct of that as well. So I think it's unlikely that we'd be able to, to switch off the sources of, of mercury tomorrow, um, and I think I'm not aware of n numbers um, with regard to how much is actually coming up through um, all the different food avenues of the food webs in the, in the marine environment. There's been some very interesting work that I don't have time to talk about now. We can talk afterwards or offline regarding s the sparing effect of selenium. And if you eat fish that has selenium in it, uh, the selenium binds into the, uh, into the nerves before the mercury can, and it, it precludes the mercury from binding in. So that's fascinating. That's right there. Selenium is necessary for proper uh, function of the mammalian um, uh, uh, the neurological system. You have to have it in your brain. There's some uh, enticing uh, research that was just reported uh, a year ago, suggesting that if you live in an environment where there is where you're getting sufficient amount of selenium in your uh, diet, um, that uh, you have a level of protection against uh, mercury poisoning. Mercury gets in there, it binds with the selenium, uh, and inactivates the selenium uh, neuroproteins. Uh, when that happens, your body either, either surrounds them and tries to isolate them off, that they're no good anymore, or tries to get rid of them. Uh, but if you have enough, ideally, in this model, if you have sufficient selenium in your diet, then you have a fair amount of protection against um, uh, mercury poisoning, methyl mercury poisoning. Uh, the bad news is that uh, if you live on continents that are granitic, have granitic soils, and you, you have animals that feed off of, an, an, uh, of a produce produced on granite, as opposed to basalt like islands in the ocean, um, in the granitic environment, we have a lot of selenium. In the island environments, selenium is not very plentiful, so probably the mercury uh, danger is higher for folks who live on oceanic islands by, by this model. The verdict is out on that. Let me emphasize it yet. But, uh, but uh, the, the models and the theory are, are, appear to be quite robust. Sam, one for you from Mystic. What is your evaluation of the effectiveness of the stranding network for making biological samples available for research in OHH by the research community? Uh, one minute left. R reasonable with room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what are the priority areas in OHH for funding through the National Science Foundation and through which directorates or divisions? Um, all of the funding for Ocean Human Health right now are through Division of Ocean Sciences in collaboration with uh, 
um, with uh, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and NIH. Uh, this is the agency in the government where you tell us what the priorities are. We don't tell you what the priorities are. Okay. And I've got a, a real quick one here. So how can the broad network of aquaria contribute towards collaborative in situ research with marine mammals? That's not a quick question, but I think um, uh, developing building partnerships, looking for opportunities to collaborate with local researchers who are working on marine mammals, um, making captive uh, marine mammal populations available um, for, for study um, would be a, a good step as well. I know a lot of uh, aquarium and zoological um, places already do, um, but that's, that would be um, a, a benefit. And also trying to build in that full ecosystem picture. So if you have the marine mammals and the fish and everything else, let's build the full ecosystem picture. I want to thank all of the panelists. We looked to set up those last few minutes as uh, something of a game show to see how quickly they could get out some of the toughest questions they had been, they had been asked through the, uh, through the hours, especially from our online uh, pin site at Mystic Aquarium. One reason why we need to keep to the schedule is because uh, the, uh, the sessions we have here are in complement with what is being webcast online through Oceans Live and Capitol Hill Ocean Talk. And the lunchtime session that they will be broadcasting is among the most interesting that we've had all week. Um, they will be featuring from uh, uh, several dozen feet under the water, about 60, 70 feet under the water, uh, a live webcast with Fabian Cousteau, who right now, uh, Fabian as the, as the grandson of the famous Jacques Cousteau. Uh, we celebrated Jacques' birthday yesterday, June 11th. He, would, uh, he was born in 1910, so would have been about 104 years old if he was still alive. And uh, in celebrating his grandfather's birthday, Fabian is doing nothing other than trying to break his grandfather's record. Uh, Jacques Cousteau had been underwater for 30 days uh, in full saturation as an aquanaut. And so Fabian is currently in the midst of mission 31, trying to break his, fa his grandfather's record by one day. Uh, underwater, and uh, his home for these 31 days is none other than the Aquarius uh, underwater marine habitat, uh, the only such habitat and underwater lab in the world. I mean, that's amazing to think about that pause for a moment. The only place to be underwater uh, for that length of time happens to be the Aquarius, which happens to be in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. You would think that uh, for all the investment we have in outer space, we would have more investment and more places like the Aquarius for our inner space. In any event, it should be a fascinating uh, discussion. I encourage you all to grab your lunch, come back in here where it will be broadcast. And, um, and so with that, let me let everybody get to lunch and thank the panel one more time. See you at 1.15. Hey, so that was a terrific discussion. Thank you.